All right, uh, God and sexuality. <laughs> it's a bit of an awkward one, isn't it? Uh, because it's, it's one of those topics that we uh, all are interested in, but never sure how to actually talk about. And it's also one that because we don't talk about it, it causes us undue problems. When we don't talk about sexuality and what is godly sexuality, what we end up with is the temptations that all of us as humans are faced with because of our search for intimacy. And we look for intimacy wherever it can be given to us. How many of you guys know about the love languages? Uh, you know, it's, it's a book that kind of gives us an idea of the five love languages. And there's quite a lot of truth to those five love languages. Uh, and then, of course, all of us have different forms of love language. And that also causes us to figure out who we have more intimacy with than the other person. Here's the problem. When we fall in love with somebody, we normally fall in love with somebody who has the absolute opposite love language to us. Very rarely do we actually fall in love with somebody who's got a very similar love language. When, when we do fall in love with that person, uh, you know, there are other problems that arise outside of the love language. For example, for, for my wife and I, my wife, uh, her love language is acts of service. If I do nice things for her without her asking me to do them, then I'm in the good books when it comes to the other love. Whereas my love language is touch, all right? And non-sexual touch, just touch. I like, and my son's love language is touch as well, which means that Alec and I can be yapping at each other and get angry with one another, and you know, he's got a mouth on him. No idea where it comes from, and as a, <laughs> as a result, you know, we argue with one another all the time, but what he does to show that he still wants to belong is he comes and hugs. He comes and touches. And boys tend to do this. Boys, as a whole, are more touchy-feely than girls as a whole. Girls as a whole tend to look at us, you know, and, and form a bond face to face and intimacy, which is not very comfortable for a lot of men because they're always thinking about 15 other things uh, and looking at a girl's face for an extended period of time makes them go, oh, not sure where to go with this. All right. So Alec and I get on very well. My daughter Kirsten, who's older than Alec, her love language is quality time. Now you can imagine that in my job, finding quality time for my spouse is hard enough. Finding quality time for my 15-year-old daughter is near on impossible. And that means that when she comes, she comes for a hug like this. Sorry, Wayne, I'm just going to come up. She comes for a hug like this. And that's it. That's all she, you know, that's enough. If I squeeze her, she's like, get off me. <laughs> because touching like that just is not comfortable for her. Whereas if I sit with her in a restaurant, and it's just the two of us, if we go to Dome for breakfast, uh, and it'll take me about 15 to 20 minutes for her to have a discussion with me. And then all of a sudden she is off and she will talk about all kinds of things. Uh, and it takes me about 20 to 30 minutes to get her to that point, And then it's two and a half hours of conversation. Whereas before that, she won't say a word to anybody. So love language is very important. We are on a search for mission. I just want to share with you a few things about the human body when it comes to, and it's again a very broad outline of, um, of what's going on when it comes to churches and how churches experience sexuality within their own ranks and talk about it. The first one is the Shakers. The Shakers were a great group of people. Uh, Anne Lee was the one who actually started the Shakers and she lost four children as a result of sexual activity. And back in those days, you know, they weren't very good doctors. If a woman got pregnant, uh, quite often the woman would die. Uh, if she didn't die, the children would die. And she'd experience horrifying pain and suffering from the fact that her children died as a result of birth and, of course, of sexuality. So when she started the Shaker movement, she actually decided that one of the most important things that she could do was to encourage her church members not to be sexually active. And so the Shakers did not last long. <laughs> They're known as the Shakers because uh, in their meetings, there'd be an awful lot of shaking going on, non-sexually, <laughs> which is quite fascinating. And because they didn't have that sexual intimacy as part of their lifestyle, the Shakers in North America are known as some of the finest wood makers, cabinet makers in all of North America. If you buy a piece of Shaker furniture, it is worth literally tens of thousands of dollars. It's so beautifully made. No glue, uh, no nails, simply wedges put together and fitted so beautifully that it just works all the time. 
Well, when your mind is not on sex, you can do an awful lot of things that are actually quite good. The next one is the Oneida com community. Oneida is, or, or Onida is an Indian name, and it's the community that was formed in 1848 by John Noyes, who really struggled to control his sexuality. And his, his solution as a Christian to the fact that he desired more than one woman in his life was that he came up with the concept of complex marriage. Now, complex marriage is fascinating. Because here in North Perth, you've experienced the concept of complex marriage. And some of you might know, some of you might not know. But we do have some churches in WA, in the Adventist church, who have got several men, and predominantly it's men, who convince the women, and predominantly it's weak-minded women, uh, and I mean weak in the sense that they're just like, oh, this sounds good to us, uh, to actually have four or five female partners for every single man, or they'll have several male and female partners coming together, and they call this godly complex marriage. Complex is actually a very good term for it because the complexities that come as a result of these kinds of relationships are amazing. It's the reason why in scripture there is, uh, Paul actually says a few things that, that we should take into, into account. The first thing that Paul says is, I wish that all of you were like me and that you did not have these desires that control you. However, if you cannot control these desires, then I'm telling you to make sure that you marry one woman and one woman marry one man. And then he goes on to say that sexual sin is in a very different category compared to any other sin. He says that sexual sin is sin against the body. And it's true. For those of us, uh, male or female, who have been involved in relationships outside of marriage, either before marriage or during marriage, you'll realize that one of the things that happens when I, as a pastor, talk and counsel with them is the intense sense of guilt that they're dealing with, number one. And number two is that the guilt is not something that goes away. When you have sex, with somebody who's not your committed relation, your committed partner, you're actually uh, sinning against your body in that the memory of that person lasts with you for a lifetime. You can't get rid of it. Which is why pornography is such a pernicious, sinful environment for, for us as men. We as men are turned on by what we see. And when we see something beautiful, we're attracted to that beauty. And if we don't have to put a lot of time and effort into it, that means that we get to enjoy the endorphin high of that beauty without having to actually have a conversation. This is very attractive to us as men. You know, because we as men don't talk as much as you as women, and so therefore if there's a woman who's on television cavorting for my pleasure, and I'm able to get off because of her, hey, we all win. And then we all lose. And what we don't realize is that as we all lose, we lose big over time. And what, what has happened is, is that we, we tend to actually see this as being a crime, a, a victimless crime. And yet what Paul says is that since it's, since it's sin against the body, it's not a victimless crime. It's actually a crime that has a huge amount of victims. And the corporate nature of that body means that when you are sinning sexually with an individual and you think, well, it's just the two of us, we made this decision, the, the ripple effect of that sexual encounter actually has a effect like a tsunami on the church as a whole, on the body of Christ as a whole. It's one of the reasons why churches have made it so distinctly um, uh, you know, against its faith when it comes to sexuality. They're very strong, very black and white, and which is why we've got this as a result, shakers and the Oneida community. Are you with me so far? All right, and we know that this is true in, in our own culture as well as Seventh-day Adventists. I went to a, a very conservative Seventh-day Adventist high school. It was called Lorbrook Academy, and Lorbrook Academy had a, a strong policy that since men are attracted by what they see, then that the women were therefore going to have to wear things that would not cause us to sin as men. <laughs> you know, that's kind of hard because most of us as men tend to have very, very big fantasy lives and therefore no matter what it is that you're wearing, we can pretty much figure out what we'd like to see underneath. Okay, I'm being as blunt as possible here. Daniel, if I'm being too blunt, please let me know. Uh, in three and a half years, you can fire me and everybody else can take on as well. So, so at that high school, they actually had pink and blue sidewalks. Not literally, 
not figuratively, but, but I mean, yeah, figuratively, not literally. So, so they had a, a side of campus that belonged to men, a side of campus that belonged to women, and never the two would meet. In fact, if we had to walk on the same sidewalk as a girl's sidewalk, we always had to make sure that we had a chaperone with us. Of course, at 2 o'clock in the morning, all the chaperones were sound asleep. <laughs> and, you know, unfortunately, I ended up going home for an extended period of time <laughs> as a result of one of those excursions. Well, the Roman Catholic Church uh, here, in the early and middle church, and we're going to use the Roman Catholic Church at the moment because it was the early church, and there was a lot of good things that the Roman Catholic Church actually brought into faith, and then of course, because they've been around for so long, there are some heresies that actually occurred as well. And the same thing is true for us as Seventh-day Adventists. The longer we stick around as an Adventist church, the more heresies we're going to have to deal with, and the more orthodoxy we're going to have to try and meld into place. And this is where freedom becomes a massive issue. So, in the early in middle church, the Roman Catholic Church, celibacy uh, was very, very good because it was anti-self-abuse, masturbation, and they thought that sex was dirty. Sexlessness was elevated to spiritual superiority. And the reason for that comes from their theology. You know when we talk about Mary being born, uh, not Mary being born, but Jesus being born of Mary, we talk about the, the, um, the miracle of the fact that Mary delivered the Son of God. You know, it was a miracle. To the Roman Catholic, it's not Jesus being born of Mary that's the miracle. It's Mary herself who's the miracle. And they came up with a term called the Immaculate Conception. And the reason that the Immaculate Conception is very important for them is that their, um, their theologian, Augustine, came up with this idea that um, every single one of us is born with a macula, a dark spot, a stain on our life. And the miracle is that Mary was immaculate, without macula, without sin, without a dark spot on her life. And therefore, because she was perfect, because God made her so, God was therefore able to implant baby Jesus in her womb. And it is that which is the miracle. Are you with me? So in their estimation, mankind is made dirty by sexual connections with women. And Augustine is the one that actually pushes this concept. Now you've got to understand, Augustine, before he became a Roman Catholic priest, a monk, was actually a, a father. He actually had a prostitute who was his wife. Uh, and he had at least one child that we're aware of with her. And he decided one day that this relationship that he had with this woman could not go on, so he left he left northern Africa, which is where he's from, and went into Italy. And when he went into Italy, he did not bring his partner and he did not bring his child. And from that point on, he changed his perspective as to what was healthy sexuality. So he started to say that true manly spiritual men were those who avoided sex with dirty women because women were the ones who had caused men to sin in the first place. You get that kind of theology? So since that time, um, we have had a massive issue when it comes to male-female relationships within Christianity. And as a result of that, we've also had very strong delineations as to who has the authority to do spiritual things on behalf of the church, because if it's a woman, it's dirty. And if it's a man, it's holy and spiritual. Never mind the fact that 62% of the church is actually female and very few men actually come to church. So sexlessness is actually elevated to spiritual superiority. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are actually quite a number of Catholic priests who are married and who have children. If you're an Anglican, and you married, and you had children, and then you decided that you wanted to become a Catholic priest, which many Anglican pastors do, the Roman Catholic Church actually allows you to come and become a priest within their faith, maintaining your relationship with your partner without having to go through a divorce. But if you come into it as a young man, you must take an oath of celibacy, which is quite interesting uh, and, and fascinating, particularly when we look at the ways in which they, uh, the, the problems that they've been having recently. Hinduism. Hinduism, which is my background. Celibacy. Yeah? If you look at the Hindus, uh, quite a number of the Hindus, they always talk about the really special gurus, and the gurus, you know, are the ones who actually are able to sit 
you know, and do the little, uh, do the little thing, you know, whatever they're doing. Uh, and they're the ones that the Beatles really loved in the 60s and early 70s, and they've continued to have quite a charming, and most of them are celibate, most of them actually practice celibacy and all kinds of other things. But in direct contrast to that is that the Kama Sutra, or the Kuma Sutra, however you spell it, uh, is from India. How many of you have seen this? Raise your hands, please, so I can see and count. I said this to our pastors, and a couple of them said, we've got it on our iPhone. <laughs> so I was like, TMI, TMI. <laughs> ah, Brad Thomas being one of them. So <laughs> I give Brad a hard time. Anyway, so, so this idea of total sexuality from the Kuma Sutra, uh, which is all about sexual intimacy with pictures, positions, and all that, uh, to this idea of sexual celibacy. Mahatma Gandhi, when he uh, took over towards the end of his life, he had stopped having sexual relations with his wife because he felt that those sexual relationships, while he enjoyed the intimacy with his partner, were actually detracting and taking away vital energy from him so that he couldn't do his job, which is fascinating. He's actually put that in his memoirs. And if you look around at uh, sports teams, a lot of sports teams, the coaches will actually stand up in front of the male sports members and tell them we've got a big game against the West Coast Eagles on Sunday. From Thursday night till Sunday, you're not to have sexual relationships with your wives because I want you to be fighting mad. Really silly. And one of the reasons I don't play sports. <laughs> Adventism. Adventism has a fantastic and a horrible book all at the same time. I say fantastic because Messages to Young People actually has some great stuff in it. Unfortunately, Messages to Young People is selected writings, and whoever decided to put the writings together probably was having real problems with their own sexual drive. And as a result, the vast majority of the statements in Messages to Young People are negative in nature. If you were to choose to read Messages to Young People at 9 o'clock at night and just read page by page, by midnight you're depressed. And you're really depressed because you'll see that there's no way that you can actually do everything that's actually being said in the book. So it came out, it was a hundred years ahead of our time when it came to us as Seventh-day Adventists. In 1863, when Ellen White actually started, uh, well, when the church began, Ellen White came out with the book um, Ministry of Healing and a couple of other books that had a tremendous impact on the holistic lifestyle of Seventh-day Adventists. And as a result of that, there was actually quite a of information about the sexual holistic lifestyle of Adventism. And we as Seventh-day Adventists have struggled with this ever since. For example, how many of you have seen the picture of Ellen White who is standing and she's got her hand on the shoulder of her husband who's sitting? How many of you have seen that picture? A few of you have seen that picture? It's a beautiful picture and when you're looking at Ellen, she looks very, very, um, you know, for her time, fit uh, and everything's going well. What most people don't know is that when that picture was taken, she was nine months pregnant. But as they took the picture, they doctored the picture. Because having a pregnant prophet, you know, it's a little bit uncomfortable for people. So they actually cut off the belly. <laughs> so she doesn't look like she's nine months pregnant. Because we were uncomfortable with the concept of sexuality as well. And it has been so. So quite often, I remember as a boy growing up, uh, you'd be sitting down and there would be some elder who was taking the Sabbath school lesson and he would talk about the fact that when it comes to sexuality here, you know, guys, we, you need to recognize that there is a problem uh, and please make sure that you're not eating eggs and meat because that drives the animal passions. And if that's driving the animal passions, you might actually do something that's quite wrong. And she also spends quite a bit of time and when I say quite a bit of time, she doesn't, we as church members do, uh, dealing with issues of masturbation and so on. And so there's a very negative understanding of sexuality right from the get-go instead of recognizing that sexuality is a beautiful, godly gift. When we start to see sexuality as God's gift to us as humans, that changes what we think about sexuality as a whole. Because if it is a godly gift to us, then we have to recognize that God, in giving us that gift, would be making it very clear as to where the boundaries lay, and that as long as we were working sexuality within that boundary, we were not going to get harmed. We would be satisfied and emotionally and intimately satisfied without the pain and suffering that comes when sexuality steps out of those boundaries. All right? So think of it as a gift. Greeks and bodies. Plato. 
Plato says the spirit is good, the body is very bad. Nothing that you do with your body is good. In fact, the less that you do with your body, the better off you are. That affected the Roman Catholic Church, and therefore it has affected us as Protestants as well. Platonic salvation involves being free from the body, and this philosophy has made many and most Christians struggle with a positive view of their bodies. Sex being a bodily function is therefore bad, and worst of all, women are the main culprits. If we didn't have women, men would be fine. Now that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Because frankly, wherever you go and there's a whole bunch of men together, homosexual behavior occurs. Because again, men are driven by what they see and men are driven by the deepest desire right from the get-go. You know, and I, I don't want to be, and if I, if I offend on you, please let me know and I'll, I'll try, but we need to be as open about this as possible. When it comes to sexuality, uh, boys are sexual almost from the moment that they're born without even knowing about it. You know, I can remember, uh, and my son will be embarrassed that we're talking about this, so please don't tell him, but, you know, I can remember my son as a baby boy, you know? You know you're, you're cleaning his diaper, and they pee right in your face, right? I mean, it's, it's an amazing skill, you know? As a man, I'm just like, yeah, this is... The first time your son goes and pees against a tree is a good day, you know? I mean, it's a wonderful day. <laughs> I know, it's strange for you. About, but I, you know, we're strange as men. So here, here's this boy, and I can remember, you know, seeing him, and, and he's got, you know, just a natural uh, erection. Now, for a father, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's like, this is good. And my mother's like, oh, you know, my wife's like, what's, oh, I'm like, hon, this is important. So she finally understood that it was okay, and everything's good. The, 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 the problem for us as parents as well is how do we deal with it when they start having questions about sexuality at the age of 10, 11, 12? And really, they're starting to ask questions about sexuality at the age of five, six, and seven. Because as soon as they go to school and they're sitting in the classrooms, their friends have been watching MTV and the gyration of the women on the MTV channel and the scantily clothed men and women. And they're, and they're seeing the double standard that happens of men who are just checking the girls out, you know, and they're doing their thing, wearing their hats and, their un, you know, and everything. And the girls are all wearing their little bras, you know, bits and pieces are hanging out just so. And, you know, they come to class and they start doing these same kind of dances. And our children come home. I had my son and daughter come home one day and they started doing doing, you know, uh, uh, a little dance, and I looked at them, what in the world are you doing? I know, this is what's happening at school. You're like, what is that about? <laughs> you know, because not everybody has exactly the same standards, and that's cool, and what that means is that we have to actually be in, uh, I hate to use indoctrinating, but it's a good word to use, indoctrinating our children as to what is proper sexuality right from the get-go, and the way that we do that in healthy relationships is to show a healthy sexual um, uh, without the physical aspect of it in front of your children, but a healthy sexual, you know. So we kiss in front of our kids all the time. I grab my wife's bottom in front of our children all the time. Alex's like, oh, I'm like, that's right, this is mine, you know. <laughs> you know, and my daughter's like, please do not talk to me. <laughs> and, well, this is important because as they see that, we laugh about it. You know, and Kimberly's playfully doing, you know, all that stuff is important in front of our children because they need to recognize that it's a godly gift. And as a godly gift, we should be enjoying it to the full within the confines of a relationship of marriage. And when that happens and it's happening well, our children also gain from it. It doesn't mean that they're not going to make mistakes because all of us know that we all have made mistakes, but we're hoping that they make less mistakes as a result. So therefore, Last one there, Lauren Winner, she has a quote. I, I just want to have this uh, read for you. The Christian story at its core has very positive things to say about bodies, but throughout its history, the church has sometimes equivocated. We Christians get embarrassed about our bodies. We're not always sure that God likes them very much. We're not always sure whether our bodies are good or bad. And the reason for that is that you will probably not remember the first time that you saw your mother or father naked. But they remember it like it was yesterday. You ran into the room and they were, you know, getting busy. Do you remember that day? No, some of you didn't? I remember it quite well in my mind. <laughs> it's one of those days that, you know, I just can't erase from the head. Um, and and I'll, again, I'll be blunt again, you know, my wife and I were busy uh, enjoying each other's company when uh, my son ran in. Mom! And mom was like, ah! <laughs> and Terry was like, oh! 
Oh, 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 son, how are you? <laughs> Give me five, baby. <laughs> uh, and fortunately, Alec hasn't ever said anything about it, you know, because he's just like, whatever, whatever. Uh, but somewhere deep inside his brain, if we had said, get out, he would have always equated mom and dad's intimacy with something negative, something not positive. <laughs> you know, all it was was embarrassing. Huh? The same thing is true the first, you know, when your children are very young, you're walking around the house, you're taking a shower, they walk in, they see you naked, it's no big deal. But there's a certain age where they turn eight or nine where all of a sudden it becomes kind of interesting. You go, oh, do you look like me? You know, uh, and I can, you know, when, and I, again, I, I don't want to offend you, but, and we want to be right up front, but if, if I'm out at a tree peeing on a tree and Alec comes out to pee on the tree, what do you think he's looking at? He's looking and saying, well, you're like me, Dad. You know, what's going on down there? <laughs> And you've got two things. You can hide it and go like this. Or you can just say, well, son, this is the way things are. You know, you'd be happy with the way that God has created your body. Never be ashamed of it. And those are important words. When you say that to a child, never be ashamed of your body. Always treat it with the respect that God has given it and the holiness that God has given it, but never be ashamed of it. That does something to a child. They're no longer ashamed. And there is something terrible about a child who's five or six who's been running around naked around the house, going out to the beach, dropping their trousers and rushing into the water. We all look at it, ha, 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 it's pretty funny. And then something changes. Somebody said something to them, and all of a sudden they started to get ashamed about their bodies. You, you remember that day? This is that tension that we have. And this tension was also done by us as Christian missionaries. We would go into different countries, and in those countries, they didn't have the same kind of, of um, they weren't offended by the same things that we were offended by. So if you go to a French country, and you're walking down the beach in New Caledonia, you're walking down the beach, there'll be two or three women walking down the beach with very little on. <laughs> you're standing next to your wife, who's looking at you, and you're looking at the water. <laughs> <laughs> now, at first you're embarrassed about the whole thing. You're like, oh dear, oh dear, what do you do? Where do you go? What do I look at? I mean, it's bouncing everywhere, you know, what do you do? And so, you, you know, I looked at my wife and said, well, what do you think of that, sweetie? <laughs> and she goes, of what? I said, well, you know, it's hard to miss. It's coming straight out. <laughs> uh, you know, for the first 15 or 20 minutes, it was at the back of my mind all the time. I was like, where are they? Where are they going? Oh, there they are. I was like, look that way. <laughs> but something strange happened. After about 30 or 40 minutes, there were so many of them walking up and down the beach. Guess what? You just get to the point where like, oh, yeah, whatever. And in some countries, that's exactly the way it was. People would walk down the street naked, no issue whatsoever. The missionaries came in, the missionaries were offended. Whoa, this is terrible. You all need to put on clothes. And so they did. And when they put on the clothes, they started to have issues with their own sexuality, and they had issues with what was propriety, you know, what was, what was, what was piousness and what was right. Uh, it got to the point, like in the Cook Islands, in the Cook Islands, when the missionaries came, all of a sudden, all the women in the Cook Islands, they wear white dresses with white hats. You ask yourself the question, where did that come from? And when you ask them, they tell you, well, the missionaries, when they came in, told us that we had to be wearing things that were pure. And so they put on the white clothing. And so it's because of a Western sensibility that breasts are a sexual thing that all other nations have been forced under Christianity to dress up to our sinful nature. Isn't that fascinating? I find that fascinating, at least. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I think that you should you know, dress appropriately, but quite often our own sexual uh, deviance or problems are forced on other people. So God and sex. So God created bodies and he said that they were good. If you remember that on the sixth day, he created Adam, he said, it's good. Then he created Eve and he said, it is good. So bodies are very good. And as a result, Jesus himself expanded the ethical responsibilities of sexuality. But he speaks very little about it other than in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 28. And in 5, 27, verse 28, he says, I tell you the truth, uh, if you even think about it, you have actually sinned. And for all of us, we're like, aye, what does that mean? So we have been fighting a battle for our, amongst ourselves. If I look at a beautiful woman, is it sinful to look at that beautiful woman, yes or no? 
uh, those who say yes, turn and raise your hands. Those who say no, a few of you, some of you are not too sure. No, it's not a sin to look at a beautiful woman. What is a sin is to continue to look at the beautiful woman and to say, I wonder what that, what that would be like. You know, I bet she digs me. You know? And you know what's true? I'm saying this out of a joke, but the fact is pretty much 90% of all men believe that they could have whichever woman they wanted whenever they wanted. It would be nice, wouldn't it, Wayne? Yes, it would be nice. Yes, yes. Yes. It's only when we turn 45 that we realize how untrue that is. Okay? I'll tell you when it happened to me when I realized that this was no longer true. I was sitting, uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, no longer, never true, whatever. Well, you give me some hope here, you know. <laughs> I'm sitting in my office uh, as a youth director, sitting in the office, and having a wonderful day, working away on my little Apple computer, looking out the window, beautiful birds in the sky, when my PA runs around into my office and comes straight up to me and says, hey, Terry, smell my boobs. <laughs> now, I'm not going to tell you who the PA was. <laughs> You're going to have to think who that was. And I looked at her like a rabbit in the headlights. <laughs> I was like, you know, and literally the headlights were right there. <laughs> I was like, ah, uh, young lady, you need to walk back out there and come in with a different question. She's like, no, 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 don't worry about that. I just put on some new perfume spell. So I went, yep, that's nice, you know. <laughs> and she walked away. I got out of my chair. I went all the way down to Warwick. And I told Warwick, Warwick, I just want to let you know that my PA has come in. She just told me to smell her boobs. <sighs> you know, I'm a little concerned. I did not ask for any of this to happen. The window was right there. It was open. People could have walked by. I'm just telling you, I didn't do anything. And Warwick took off his glasses. He was dying of laughter. Like, what is the world? Is so I go over to Lynn Turner, who is our receptionist, and I said, Lynn, this is what's happened. And she looked at me and says, eh, that's all right, Terry. What? She thinks of you as her grandfather, so you're safe. <laughs> <laughs> that was the day I realized I was then old. I was like, I went home and I told my wife and she laughed and laughed. I was like, you're killing me here. <laughs> you know, what's going on? So, you know, this, again, it comes back to this, this whole drive of male sexuality where we actually do believe. You know, we know it's not true, but we kind of, we kind of you know, therefore, it's very important to recognize as women you actually have a significant amount of power over us as men. And it's also one of the reasons why quite often we don't understand what it means for you to be best friends with us. We just don't get it. <laughs> because best friends have benefits for us, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so we're just trying to figure out what does this mean? I just don't get it. I don't understand. You know, it's either you're friends with me or you're not, you know what I mean? <laughs> the story makes it very tough. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying we have to learn and we learn that as men over time. It's not something we learn when we're young. We learn it as we get older and start to recognize the value of women outside of their physical bodies. All right? And for us as men, it takes a, a, a very long time. All right, so here, Jesus and sexuality. John, chapter 1, 1 and 14. God became a human being using the human reproductive system, albeit via supernatural conception, but end result is that Jesus was a flesh and blood individual. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 and 15 says so. And therefore Jesus was tempted in all things including sexuality. I wonder how Jesus dealt with it. You know? <clears throat> we don't really have a lot to, to say about Jesus' teenage years. But coming from a man's perspective, and again I don't want to offend anybody, but coming from a man's perspective You'll find that when it comes to school between the ages of 14 and 16, a man has very little control of what goes on down in the nether regions of his body. In fact, quite often, you'll see guys carrying their books right here. Right? And the girls are like, what's going on? And the guys are like, hey, what's happening? <laughs> well, it's because they can't control their erections. And so therefore, they're just sitting there going, oh. And, and female teachers, I mean, you know, the, the one of the loves of my life was Mrs. Lowry. I mean, she was just gorgeous. And so I would sit in class for very long, extended periods of time during that time, learning how to control. That takes time. Girls don't understand that because for a girl, you guys aren't turned on by what you see. Right? Yes, yes you are? I know that Lydia is, because she's told me. <laughs> I, just, 
I seem to recall something about running up and down those steps, Lydia, you know, <laughs> in King's Park. <laughs> oh, dear. You know, so there is truth to that fact, but it's still not the same kind of intense desire right off the bat. So for a guy, quite often the intense desire is straight as soon as they look at a woman, woo, we're ready to go. Whereas a woman can look at a man and go, oh, that's a nice guy. But over time, the deepness of their intimacy actually appreciates. And again, this is beholden on us as men to learn how to have the patience to work with that in order for the joy of sexuality as God has given it to us uh, uh, is good. All right, so we've already gone through 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, and on 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2 and 3 to 7. If you open up your Bibles to that one, you'll see that that is the passage where, um, where Paul actually tells uh, uh, people who are married to be very uh, uh, understanding of the desires that each person has one for the other. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Who's got that? I'll read it. Now, for the matters you wrote, verse 1, it is good for a man not to marry. <clears throat> By the way, I think here that Paul was actually not being inspired. I say that, I say that with qualifications, okay? I'm not saying that his words weren't inspired, I'm saying that he was actually using his own background to say something that truly was not in accordance with the word of God. Because what does the Bible say in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3? Be fruitful and not multiply, and it is not good for? Uh, so it's not good, that's godly ordained ministry. Paul comes in and says, now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry. But since there's so much immorality, each man should have his own wife, each woman her own husband. And the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. And likewise, the wife to her husband, the wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body also does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other sexually, except by mutual consent, and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. For I wish that all men were like me, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that one. And obviously celibacy is a gift from God. There are some people who can be celibate for all of their lives, but it is not, it is only by a gift. It is not because, you know, that's what God intended. God intended for us to have relationships because God himself is a relationship between three. Right? And the joy that you get from that relationship and the frustration that you also get from that relationship are important in terms of the joy of life as a whole. So Paul there, uh, and he goes on in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 5, and Galatians, and, and on and on. There's plenty of good theological study that you can do. Uh, most of it is Pauline when it comes to sexuality because very few of the other people were even very interested in it. Um, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Recognize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, what you do with your body, what you put inside your body, is very important to the kind of connection that you can have with God. Which is why Paul says, sexual sin is sin against the body. He doesn't say that about any other sin. It's the only sin that he says is sin against the body because the ramifications of sexual sin don't just affect you, and you for the rest of your life, it affects your family, it affects your children, it affects the grandchildren, it affects the third and fourth generation, and it also affects the church as a whole. And when the church decides not to deal with sexual sin, then for a lot of people, they look around and go, oh, well, we can choose to do what we'd like to do because the church hasn't really put up a stance on it. And quite often, when pastors have to stand up and say, as a church board, we need to deal with this sexual issue because nobody has dealt with it, it needs to be dealt with firmly, the church says, oh, but come on, pastor, people need to make their choices, you know? Love, it's love. You're right, it is a choice, but it's the wrong choice. And biblically, as pastors and as churches, we have to stand up for what is right. To do it in love, not to do it in hatefulness, to do it in love, but to stand up for what is right, okay? Now, just a few, um, a few things. Sex outside of marriage. There's not a shred of evidence to allow righteous sexual relationships outside of marriage. Not a single shred in scripture. It is amazing to me how men, and in particular men, who understand scripture well, can manipulate scripture to make people believe that it's okay to have more than one 
partner when it comes to sexuality. It's not okay. And there's nothing in scripture that allows you to do it. In fact, when we look at stories in the Old Testament, we see clearly that those stories are horrendous because of the more than one sexual partner. Come with me to the book of Genesis. Let's look at a great story in the book of Genesis. Um, <clears throat> we've got the story of Rachel and Leah, which is a wonderful story on the problems of sexuality. And then in Genesis chapter 38 and verse 1, we've got this great story, which by the way, uh, some churches use as the, the, um, their rationale for not using contraceptives when it comes to sexuality. 38 verse 1. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Abdullam named Hira. There, Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua. He married her and lay with her, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son who was named Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. And she gave birth still to another son and named him Shelah. It was a Kazib that she gave birth to him. Now Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, You lie with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to produce offspring for your brother. Now, for us, we look at this and say, why? Well, back in those days, a woman had only the value that she, that she was able to produce. If she had daughters, her value was quite low. If she had sons, her value was increased because once her husband died, then the sons could actually produce and take care of her life until she died. So it was the responsibility of the family who you were married into to ensure that you as a woman were given every possibility to have a good and honorable life. Therefore, if you married the eldest son and the eldest son died, you were given the second son whose responsibility it was, was to produce an heir for you who would provide and take care of you. Kind of a strange one, isn't it? But this is what the way the scriptures uh, tell us. Verse 9. Onan knew that the baby would not be his. So whenever he lay with his brother's wife, he would spill his semen on the ground to keep from producing offspring for his brother. And what he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so he put him to death also. By the way, this is the one text that the Roman Catholic churches use to say that you cannot have contraceptives when it comes to sexual relationships. And this is actually a poor theology because the idea that it's because he was spilling seed on the ground that he's killed is not right. The right idea is that he was unwilling to do his duty, which was to provide for that woman. In other words, he was keeping her from having honor in her society. You get the difference? So for us as Seventh-day Adventists, and for most Protestants when it comes to contraceptives, we don't have as strong an anti-feeling to it like the Roman Catholic Church does. Because in their philosophy, in their theology, um, if there is no connection between egg and sperm, you have actually aborted the potential for a child. Which is why you get in The Life of Brian and a couple of other movies by M Monty, uh, Monty, uh, Monty Python, you know, every seed is sacred and uh, yeah, so on and so forth. Which makes for funny things when you're not in church. So, <clears throat> you, you guys know the rest of the story of Judah and Tamar? Just, yeah, just quickly for those of you who don't know. Uh, so Tamar is promised Sheila. Uh, Judah says to her, I'll give you Sheila when he's, get, when he's older. And then when he gets to his age, Judah does not give him to Tamar. Then Tamar does something which is quite amazing. She must have known Judah quite well. And it indicates what kind of a man Judah really was. I remember that Jesus comes out of the lineage of Judah. So there's plenty of grace here. But Judah goes on his regular trips with his sheep, sees Tamar in a tent that's obviously a prostitution tent, goes in, sleeps with her, she's got her face veiled so he doesn't know who it is, she gets pregnant, he gets righteously indignant that she would actually have a baby out of wedlock, how could she? The cur of a woman, and so she calls, he calls and says, it's my right to put her to death because she has brought dishonor upon my family, and because he paid her with staff and ring, she was able to produce the man who made me pregnant is the one who has this, and there it is. And this is indicative of the way in which men have actually treated women throughout time since the first sin occurred. Whenever there is sexual sin, who gets punished in church? The woman does. Every time. Every time. 
Uh, I remember as a pastor in, in Texas, uh, there was a young woman that came to see me. Uh, her name was Monique. Uh, she's dead now, unfortunately. But Monique uh, came to see me and she said, uh, Pastor, have you noticed anything different about me? And you know, when they say that, you, you're really in trouble already. And just like, well, what do you say? I mean, uh, no, because I hadn't. And she said, well, I'm pregnant. I was like, okay. And who is the daddy? And it was this guy from the Baptist church. So we had a Baptist Adventist relationship. Hallelujah. Things weren't going so well. Uh, and the problem was that she had been the Sabbath school teacher for the teens and youth. And she had been hammering them on sexual purity. And you know, you guys were very concerned about what you're watching. Everything is horrifying. And here the whole time that she'd been doing that, she was having an affair with this man outside of wedlock. And she wanted to know what I was going to do. And I said, well, we're, we're going to ask you to step down from your leadership positions, not because we hate you, but because we want to have as high an ideal as possible, and our leaders need to be of that same high ideal. You failed there. God is going to give you grace, just like we're going to give you grace. But for the time being, we need you to step down. That's number one. Number two, you're going to write a letter to all of our teens and youth, and you're going to apologize for the way in which you've been bamboozling them. Ooh, she struggled with that one. But pastor, what are they going to think about me? I said, sweetheart, <laughs> they're already thinking about it. <laughs> you just need to make it, make it due. And you know what we did for that woman? We loved her. We cared for her. When the baby was due, we were there. We gave a baby, uh, a baby shower for her. I did the baby dedication for that child. You know, all those things because it takes two to tango. And for some reason, it's the woman who always gets smart. I just did a wedding uh, a few weeks ago a Seventh-day Adventist young lady who came to me and she wanted me to do the wedding for, for her and her, um, her boyfriend. Her boyfriend's not a Seventh-day Adventist. So the church manual says very clearly, no, not clearly, the church manual says we strongly uh, advocate that you don't have marriages, um, what's it called? Unequally yoked, unequally yoked. But it's still left up to the pastor to make the decision. So I told her that at the very beginning. I said, you know, it's a little bit of a problem for me. The two of you are not of the same faith. But I want to hear where you're at. And by the time our 10 hours of premarital counseling were done, I was very comfortable with the fact that the two of them were equally yoked, even though they were not of the same faith. They decided that they were going to wait before shacking up and having sexual relations. They were going to wait until their wedding night, which is good, right? So they did the right thing. Her church has struggled to figure out what to do with her. She's the deputy pathfinder director. They want to take her and, and drop her from leadership. And I asked them why. There's no biblical reason why we, we need to do this. It says unequally yoked is between a person who does not believe in God and a person who does believe in God. It's not about religion. It's not about denomination. It's about what is actually bringing you together as a couple. I want to show you a passage. Come back to the book of Genesis, uh, Exodus this time. Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. There's a very interesting story uh, in here about Moses. Hmm? Exodus chapter 4 and verse... Um, let's start with verse 21. Exodus chapter 4 verse 21. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders that I've given you the power to do, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go so I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging house on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him but Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, touched Moses' feet with it, and said, Surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone, and at that time she said, Bridegroom of blood, referring to the circumcision. Strange story, isn't it? Very strange little story. But it's not strange if you realize that Zipporah is actually Arab. She is not Jewish. So cutting off the foreskin of her son is anathema. And what you also don't realize, because when we translate into English, you've got to remember that when they were translating the scripture uh, into English back in 1611, uh, you know, and, and before that, people did not talk about sexuality very strongly. So they used euphemisms. So when it says here that she took his foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it, the actual Hebrew wording 
says she took the foreskin and touched his genitals with it. So she actually touched Moses' genitals with it and said, you are a bridegroom of blood. It, it is, it's the reason why he actually sends her home. She goes home after this. And it's not until Exodus chapter 18 that we see her coming back with Jethro, her father. So she is a person who is not Jewish. She is unequally yoked. She doesn't even believe in the one true God like Moses does. We know that because Jethro did not become a true believer in God until Exodus chapter 18 when he shows up to see whether or not all the stories that had been circulating about the people of Egypt, I mean Israel, were true. And when he sees that God has been blessing them, he says, surely your God is the one true God. And in Exodus 18, he, he makes his first sacrifice to God and accepts that God is the one true God, which indicates that Zipporah and everybody else in that family were not true believers. Are you with me? So we have to be very careful as a church when we're talking about this. Do we want our children to marry Adventists? Absolutely. Do we know that if you marry somebody from outside of the faith, you're going to have a lot more trouble? Absolutely you are. But if you are going to choose to marry someone outside of your faith, make sure that that person believes in God, has an understanding of who you are, Make sure that you have an understanding of how you're going to raise your children. And if you do that right, you will actually have a good, solid marriage. Particularly if you've had time to go through the premarital counseling to ensure how to have. As a young pastor, I met a couple who came to church every Sabbath. Every single Sabbath in the church where I was an elder. And he was Baptist, she was an Adventist. And they had been married for 43 years. And I asked them what the secret of their success you know, was. And he looked at me, he said, son, we go to church every single Saturday, and we go to church together every single Sunday, and we've been doing it for 43 years. Our God is our God. The way in which we have faith is our faith. We know that we have differences of opinion. We've chosen to put them front and center. We know where our boundaries lie. We never push our partner to try and believe the way that we believe. You know, and that was a lesson for me. And again, I reiterate, it's always better to marry someone from within your faith because you're going to have far less problems when it comes to the religious aspects. But we as a church need to learn how to treat people better and how to love people better. All right, there's a lot more that can be said. I, I want to open it up for, uh, for questions. Here's another statement there. Yep. So, oh, this is a good one here. Um, how do we define sexual virginity? Uh, a lot of our young people who are 13 and 14 years of age uh, believe that they're still sexually virgins, but they've been performing oral sex for quite a long time. And it goes all the way back down to the 90s when we had President Clinton say, I did not have sex with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. And then when they was asked, what do you mean by sex? He said, please define for me what is sex. So oral sex, and he, was able, he had to admit it on television. I remember sitting down and watching it. Oral sex to him was not sexuality. Well, it is. Oral sex does count. Mutual masturbation, fooling around with that clothes on, all of that is sexuality outside of marriage. And all of that you have to recognize. Now, I'm not going to tell you where you should stop. Okay? I remember watching Tony Campolo talk about the four different kinds of kisses there are. He said there's the peach kiss, which is like this. I remember that very well. I only remember two of the four kisses. There was the peach kiss, and then there was the alfalfa kiss. <laughs> at which, you know, at the age of 14, I was like, whoa, whoa, you know, what is that kiss? Um, and he, he said something I think that is categorically true, and he's coming from a counseling point of view. He says, where do you learn to stop? You know, if you start kissing there, how much longer before you want to do a little bit more than just kissing? I know that from a man's perspective, it's within, oh, a nanosecond. <laughs> we want to do more. <laughs> no. uh, and really, inside a girl's perspective, the same thing is true. So where do you decide? I, I'm going to be quite conservative and say, you know what, guys? The moment you start physically kissing is the moment that you start down a very slippery road and it becomes more and more difficult to say no, no. No, it really does. I'm not going to tell you what you should do. I'm just going to tell you, recognize that it's going to be very difficult to say no. 
And I'll also be upfront with you and say that as a young person, I was unable to say no. I was. And I'm very, I'm very blunt about that with, uh, with people that I do premarital counseling with. Because we've got to be honest with one another and realize that, again, sexual sin is sin against the body and it affects us all as a whole. When we're honest about it and open about it and people can come and talk to us about it, then we know that we can give them grace like grace was given to us. I got suspended from high school for being stupid. Well, my girlfriend was stupid. Uh, <laughs> she let the note that we wrote back and forth, that was quite graphic, uh, get caught. And uh, what was really more uh, embarrassing was the fact that my principal in Tennessee took the note, called my mother and father, and read the note to my parents. To which my father went, ah! Oh! <laughs> and my mother was like, I go to my house. Uh, to this day, my father does not send me a birthday gift. He sends me a little note. He says, son, when you were 17 years old, I had to spend $1,400 to bring you back home by airplane. This birthday is paying off a little bit of that money. <laughs> ah, I love my father. <laughs> so there are some more definitions of biblical sex. All right, and then biblical examples. Let's go to a couple of Bible verses. And, then, and ask questions as we're looking at food. Sorry, uh, Natalie, I'll give that to you later. Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. This is a text in scripture that, no, you know, one day again, I'm going to preach about this from, from a sermon. I keep threatening to do it. I never do it because I know that I get fired, which is why I don't do it. So Proverbs chapter 5. How come I'm not finding Proverbs all of a sudden? Here it is. Proverbs chapter 5 is a wonderful passage. And remember that I start off by saying that we as men are the ones who need to learn the patience and to learn to understand the beauty of a woman from the inside out. As young men, we are challenged by beauty and we want to just be with beauty. And the thing is, is that as a woman gets older, and, I, and this, is, this is just part of life, guys. As a woman gets older, uh, things just don't look the same. You know, uh, things change. And the fact is, is that my eyesight, even though it gets worse, still is attracted to beautiful things, okay? Which means that my definition of beauty as a man has to change with the way in which my wife is changing. And scripture is very clear about that. Look here. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15. Love this passage. Drink water from your own well, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets? Should your streams of water in the public square? Let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. She is a loving deer, a graceful doe. May her breast satisfy you every day of your life, and may you ever be captivated by her love. Isn't that good? That is good. I read that to my wife regularly. <laughs> it's a great passage. But you know, the passage here is really talking about sexual... What's a fountain? Is it water? No. no. So it's a euphemism for... You guys can't even say it in church, can you? <laughs> God made your bodies. It's a euphemism for a male penis. So let them be yours and yours alone. He's being very clear. Make sure that it belongs to one person, one person only. May your fountain be blessed. And may you rejoice in the wife of youth, a loving doe. May her breast satisfy you always. When you actually look at this, it, 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 it is indicative of the fact that the woman that you fell in love with, you know the one that was firm all over, that woman, no matter how she changes between the time that you meet her and the time that she dies, you must always remember her as that woman that you fell in love with. And the moment that a man gets that inside of his head is the moment that he's able to understand the beauty of his wife. I remember when my wife uh, first had uh, uh, Kirsten. You know, she looked at herself in the mirror and she said, I've changed. I said, yes, you have. And I love it even more. That was a good night. <laughs> uh, you, know, so, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so th this is important, you know, I mean, when you recognize it. I mean, God is clear on this, right? So we have to realize that what we say as men is so important to the livelihood of our wives you know <laughs> it's it's so important because you know when our wives come up to us and say do I look fat in these pants you know the answer is yes <laughs> so say yes because even though she's like oh well listen I want you to look good 
you know, go and buy yourself a pair of pants where you don't look fat in them. You know? Because for us as men, we have such a different way of looking at things. I walk into the bedroom. Now, I've gained seven kilos since I became president in, in September, right? So, seven kilos, right? And I, <laughs> I walk in front of the mirror and I go, yeah! And then I push it all the way out, you know, like, yeah! Alec goes, oh, oh! And I say, son, these are pounds of pressure. This is important stuff. You know, and Kimberly looks at me, she laughs. I'm like, what's on? What's going on? Because for us as men, even though we wish that we were seven kilos lighter, we don't see ourselves in a negative way. Every man that you know, as soon as he looks in front of the mirror, he's like, yeah. You know? You know, you do the face and everything. You know, check me out, sweetheart. You even do the little chest pump. Mine falls over now. You know, <laughs> you know that's, that's what we do as guys because we're confident in our own skin. It doesn't matter how old you are. You're still like, I still got it. Which is why that day at the conference office was a bad day for me. <laughs> still got it. Right? And, and whereas our wives, all they see is, oh, you know, wow. <laughs> it's not who I used to be. I wonder if my husband still loves me. I wonder if he still cares for me. I wonder... And you know what? We can do such harm to the women in our lives by saying things without considering what we're saying. Yeah? And if we would just take a little bit more interest and care and nurture and protect, then man, life would be so much better for all of us as a whole. You know? That's what scripture is saying in this passage. That's why I love this passage. Alright, let's go to another one. Go to Song of Solomon which was my favorite book growing up in scripture. Song of Solomon, fantastic book. I read it from cover to cover. I think in one sitting, actually. It's one of these great books. How did this book make it into scripture? You know, who in their right mind said, this is good. This must be from God. And you know what has happened? What has happened is that we have actually looked at this book and we've said, oh yeah, this is a good book. This is about a relationship between us and God. No, 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 no. I mean, if this is the kind of relationship that we're supposed to have with God, I'm a little concerned about some of the things that are... I mean, yes, it's true. It's true about... You know, but really, it is, it is between a husband and a wife. I mean, look at the first one. The first verse. Uh, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Ooh. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfume. Your name is like perfume poured out. Ooh, no wonder the maidens love you. And I don't know if my wife has ever said, well, I wonder why all these maidens love you, Terry. No, no, no. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Oh, let the king bring me into his chambers. Let's cross over the threshold. This is good. And, you know, and all of us guys are going, what? Because this is the language of love back in the day. So we're looking at this going, oh, I, let, me, let me tell you something. Um, those of you... Uh, no, I won't embarrass you. I'll move on. <clears throat> we'll rejoice and delight in you. We'll praise your love more than, than wine. I want you to go to verse 9. Because in verse 9 and verse 12, there are two little passages here which kind of give us a very good understanding of how men see women and how women see men. Verse 9. This is the man speaking. I liken you, my darling, to a mare. All right, so I liken you, my darling, to a horse. Isn't that good? Beautiful, beautiful imagery. I mean, you know, English imagery. She has coltish legs. It's just, it's just, your mane is so beautiful. <laughs> You're just sitting there going, who wrote this stuff? That harnessed to one of the chariots of Pharaoh. So, so not only are you a horse, but you're a working class horse. You know, a war horse. I'm kind of scared of this woman. <laughs> uh, war horse. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings. Your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. Okay, very interesting and very important for you as women to recognize this is how we as men actually see you. When we see you and we fall in love with you, you are the biggest thing in our life. Not talking physical size, but talking in terms of, in terms of you know, how big you are to us. We think of you as being the center of everything that we do. We want to be with you, we send you flowers, we send you chocolates, we send you little love notes. We've never written a love note in our lives, but all of a sudden, oh my darling, you know, I mean, you're just thinking, you're looking at yourself going, who is this sap? And you keep writing it, and then you, you know, you're taking your cologne spritz, spritz, and sending it off. You know, when my wife and I were dating uh, at university, she decided, well, she decided because I was dumb. 
Uh, we had been dating for six months, and, and I went away to summer camp. She told me before I went to summer camp, she said, "Hun, I think we need to break up before you go to summer camp. Why? Because when you get to summer camp, it's an intense environment. You're going to fall in love with somebody. Nah, that's ridiculous. So I said, let's forget it. We'll stay together. Went to summer camp. Within eight days, I'd fallen in love madly with a girl named Michelle, which is why we can't see Michelle in my home. Shh, no. So Michelle, Michelle um, was beautiful. I mean, she was fantastic. Her last name was Sparky. Ah, <laughs> so I, you know, I was meant to be. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we dated for a little while, dated all summer, broke up with Kimberly, it was a horrifying thing, she lost weight, it was unbelievable. I came back uh, from summer camp, broke up with Michelle, you know, it was done, finished, come back to summer, and I wooed Kimberly for nine months. I mean, I mean, I was sappy for nine months, and she just pulled me around like a bull with a ring. You know, it was, it was shocking. <laughs> she, she manipulated me. <laughs> and then at the end of that second year, she went to Spain. She went to Spain. I mean, she couldn't get any further from me if she had tried. And I was working three jobs and going to university the whole time to pay for my phone bills to the United States. I was living with Victor Brown. And Victor Brown and I were sitting uh, the first night, uh, first, at the end of the first month, he gets a phone bill. He looks at the phone bill. He's watching the Redskins football game. And I hear this, ah! I came running in. Are you all right? And he's looking at his phone bill. That's 350 bucks back in 1990 which is a lot of money in 1990. And she says, what? It's mine, Victor. It's all good. Oh, thank you, Lord. And I had to pay him 350 bucks, which is why I was working three jobs. I called my wife to be every six days and spent an hour and a half on the phone with her in Spain. And outside of that, I wrote her a letter every three, no email back then. No, 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 no email. So I wrote her a letter every three days, handwritten letter. She sent me back. I've, I still have it. I still have the whole fo you know, folder of letters that she sent me from that year. She sent me a little spoon about that, that she had used to eat her yogurt with. I mean, how disgusting is that? But you know, <laughs> I still have that sucker. You know, I still have it in my little folder. And, and you know... At the end of that year, she comes back, and we get together again, and it was awkward for the first three or four months because we had grown apart. Even though we had been talking to one another, we had grown apart. But she was still the biggest and most important part of my life, which is why I was willing to do everything I could to maintain that relationship. That's what we call the chase. As long as men are chasing the women in their lives, they're happy. And once they've caught that woman, there's no more chase. Which is why, girls, the longer you can prevent your husband to be from having sex with you before the wedding night, you're in good. But if you put out too early, he's going to lose interest in you almost immediately. Because first of all, he won't respect you, even though you say, are you going to respect him in the morning? And he'll say, of course. No. He won't. And he'll go off looking after the next person that he can chase and chase as hard as he can. Well, it comes back down to this text. I liken you, my darling, to a mare, harnessed to one of the chariots of Pharaoh. You're the most biggest and important thing in my life. When I walk into a room holding on to you on my arm, look, my wife is the same size as I am. In fact, she's a little bit taller than I am, and I chose her on because she was a little bit taller than I am. She's got great legs. And as a result, you know, she's a little bit taller, and then when she wears heels, she towers over me. And I still walk in going, yeah. This is my wife. <laughs> you know, and when you come to a wedding, right, what does the guy usually wear? Whatever the bride told him to wear. <laughs> You're going to wear a gray suit because it's going to match the, girl, the gowns. You know, do the guys actually have, a, you know, do they really care what they wear? No, not really. In fact, if you come to a banquet, what do all the men wear at a banquet? They're penguins. You know, black and white. Boring as. A few of them might have a checkered bow tie or something, you know, or a stopwatch or something. But no, no, no. If a girl comes to a wedding or to a banquet and she spies another girl on the other side of the room wearing exactly the same clothing, <laughs> it is on, girlfriend. <laughs> and that's just <laughs> You see the difference? So for us as men, we want to see you as being huge and most important. And as long as you remain there, life is good. The moment that we as men change that picture of you from being this big central part of who you are to now becoming an object, we've changed your designation. 
And the danger for us as men is that when you become an object, then not only do I objectify you, but I can have the same kind of relationship with many other objects. That's the danger for us as men. And that's where sin comes into our lives. And that's why pornography is such a terrible thing. It is not a victimless crime. And if you are struggling with pornography, just realize all of us as men will always struggle with pornography in one form or another. And we have to actually find people who are accountable and holding us accountable so that we never have to struggle with it. You hear me? I found that when I'm talking to young men who struggle with pornography, that when I'm sharing with them, you know, you can't say, you can't just say, well, you need to pray a little bit harder and ask Jesus to actually forgive you and give you the strength to overcome it. That doesn't work unless you have somebody who's holding you accountable. When somebody's holding you accountable and coming up to you every week and saying, Terry, what have you been looking at? Then you know that you've got to have somebody, you want to make sure that you're telling that person the truth at all times. And that keeps you more accountable. And that's what Jesus says, you know, that we have to be accountable one to another in that regard. Look at the girl, verse 12. While the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My lover is to me like a little bag of myrrh, a sachet, resting between my breasts. My lover is to me like a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of En Gedi. So you get the difference? So we as men, we come into the room, yeah, I'm a man, give me beef, you know, where's my sword, ah, let's go. What does our girlfriend look at us at? Oh, like a little bag of myrrh. You know? Like a petal. Crushable. <laughs> it's, and it's true. <laughs> right, but where, where is this petal? Where is this, where is this little sachet of myrrh? Between, between her breast, which is where? Right next to her heart. Okay. So as long as she has a piece of her husband or her partner and holds it close to her heart, she's going to be a satisfied and happy person. Right? The fragrance of that man, you know, comes through. Very important. But her sinful area comes when she wants to own more of that man. Like she fell in love with him because he's this wild, crazy guy. You know, he's a bad boy. Ah. And then she gets, and she tells all her girlfriends, I'm going to change him. No, you're not. <laughs> Don't. You're not going to change him. Don't even bother. You know, I mean, all he'll do is like, whatever, girl, and he goes find somebody else. So, uh, but the concept is, as long as you can hold on to a little part of him that belongs to you and no one else, you'll be satisfied. And if you start to want to have more of him and more of him and more of him, where you're dominating his time, dominating his schedule, where were you last night? What are you doing? Because you're not trusting him and maybe you have good reason not to trust him, but for whatever reason, you know, once that happens, you start to become bitter and unhappy. Let me give you a statistic. When a couple comes in to see me who've been married for a long time, uh, and, and normally I'll say, look, I'll give you two or three sessions and then I'm, I'm out because I'm not a qualified counselor. You need to go to a qualified counselor. Um, if, if it's the woman who came in to say, Pastor Jerry, we'd like to save our marriage, the marriage is going to be saved. If it was the man who came in and said, Pastor Terry, we'd like to save our marriage, the marriage is doomed. Doomed. There are some very strong statistics that show that when it comes to the validity of a marriage staying intact for years to come, it has everything to do with the woman and very little to do with the man. If the woman stands up and says, I'm going to fight for this marriage tooth and nail, the marriage is going to survive. You know why? It's because of this one fact. When a man has an affair outside of the marriage with another woman, he will always tell her how much he loves her and cares for her. And she'll say, when are you going to leave your wife? I'm planning on it. I'm going to leave my wife. He's never going to leave his wife. Very rarely does he leave his wife. The reason being is that we as men love the sanctity of our home. We're comfortable. But we like to have a peace on the side. So we're comfortable at home. Everything's fine at home. But it's kind of boring at home. So here's this exciting woman over here. Woo, this is good. But we always come back home. And we're comfortable at home. And if the woman decides that she wants to keep that marriage intact and fight for her husband, it'll survive. If it's only the husband saying, I screwed up, I messed up, I need to sort this out and fight for it, it is doomed. Every single one of the counseling sessions that I've done 
where I've seen that happen, that's exactly what's happened. I was talking to a friend of mine, Graham Yor, who's a counselor in, the United, in, uh, in New Zealand, and he gives me exactly the same statistics. I bet that if I was to talk to most pastors, 90% or more, if the woman says that she wants to stay in the relationship, it stays, it survives. It comes back down to this whole thing. When you look at Song of Solomons and you read it carefully and you see the entendre, the double entendre that's in here between the words, you start to recognize how important intimacy is between a couple, particularly when it's done on a biblical basis. All right, uh, enough of my chatting. Any questions that you guys have? There's plenty to say about here in sexuality. So what questions do you have? If your parents are here, parents, please close your ears. You can say this on behalf of a friend. <laughs> Pastor, I have this friend. Yes, yes, you do. Yes. Okay, if a four year old asks you the question, what is sex, how do you answer? Yes, very good question. Um, you have to answer appropriate to their age. I mean, you don't go and tell them, well, mommy and daddy get together at nighttime and this is what we do. <laughs> no, no, it'd be like, ah! <laughs> You'll never be able to see you again in the same light. Um, no, what you say to them is you, you ask them, what do you mean? That's the first question you ask. If they come up to you and ask you what sex is, you know what they've been watching on television. You know what they've been seeing. If they've got friends who are talking to them, you ask them, what do you think it means? And they say, well, this is what I think it means. And then you say, well, it's a little bit different like that. It's more about mommy and daddy loving each other so much and God giving you to us as a gift. All right? And that's good enough for them. You don't have to explain to them the mechanics. As they're growing older and they're starting to ask you about the mechanics, be truthful. I, <laughs> I remember when I was uh, 14, my father came up to me and says, here's a book. And it was, what every young man should know about sex. <laughs> I read it very well. Uh, and, and realized a lot of it was rubbish <laughs> you know, by the end of the time. But that's what a lot of parents do, is like, here's a book, and then they move on. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, she, I mean, she would come and sit down, well, this is what it means, and this is what it, and I'd be like, this is so embarrassing, <laughs> right? It's probably better for a man to, with a boy and a woman with a girl, simply because it's a little bit less embarrassing, uh, and it's also dependent on the child. Like with my son, he's just all, all ears. Uh, <laughs> I can, I can, Alec and I uh, were watching uh, a movie. It was a James Bond movie, uh, and I was just watching about five minutes of it. I was trying to see if there was any part that he could see that wouldn't be a bad thing for him. And there came on the scene of this girl belly dancing. And you know, for me, it was nothing. I was like, all right, she's belly dancing. Alex said, hey, Dad, Dad, what? Something's happening. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> okay, let's talk about what it is. And he's like, oh, oh, is that why? Yeah, that's why. Oh, okay. And he was fine. So all you have to do is recognize, talk. You don't have to go into too much depth and don't embarrass them. You know, just say, well, tell me what you're feeling, how things are going, and make sure that you're able to talk to them at their level. If there, uh, you know, for, for anybody in here, if there is no husband in the relationship or no wife in the relationship, um, find a person in church that you can really connect with and get your child to connect with them. And quite often, the adult in church will actually have a better conversation with them about sexuality than you can. And they can say exactly what it is that you wanted to say, but you know that if you said it, you'd probably turn your child off. It's why we have to raise children up in a community. You can't just raise a child by yourself. You've got to do it in a community. And so Daniel's family, my family, Brad Thomas's family, Derek McCutcheon and his family, the four of us pastors, once or twice a year, we get together as families and we go out and we go camping together. There's a lot of good reasons for that. One is friendship amongst the adults. But secondly, it's friendship amongst the adults and the children. What Pastor Brad says to my children, what I say to his children or to Daniel's children, will all be cementing what they're already saying to their kids, but they're hearing it from other sources that they respect. And, and I think that's extremely important. And when we have that kind of closeness in a church where we can have safety for sexual natured things, all right? Because unfortunately, church is not always a safe place for sexual conversation, particularly if we've got some pedophiles in the church. We have to recognize them, love them for who they are, the pedophiles, but also make sure that they don't have access to our children in any way which could groom them to being participating in their deviant sexuality. Okay? Good question. Yeah. Any questions of that nature? Yes. 
Yes? Yes, we do. And we have them here in Australia as well. Yep, they're called kinship. We do have uh, quite a number of churches of homosexual Seventh-day Adventists, absolutely. Um, now, they're not officially recognized by the church. Okay? So they are members who have felt uncomfortable in the regular Adventist churches. They felt excluded or they felt like they've not been loved or cared for. And as a result, they have, they have um, started their own churches. Yes, they actually have uh, camp meetings once a year here in Australia, in New South Wales. There's Kinship Gay Camp and um, they, they meet. In fact, quite a number of us as pastors have been invited to go and speak at their camps, and we do. We'll actually go and speak um, at their camps because they need to hear the gospel just as much as anybody else. So they're struggling with one area of sin, and we're having to work with them to deal with that. Yeah. I'll, I'll be honest with you, and um, you know, some of my best friends uh, in high school are gay. Uh, Scott, and I'll tell you Scott's story. Scott, uh, Scott was very uncomfortable with his body when we first came to high school. And the high school that we went to had gang showers. I mean, for those of you who don't know what gang showers is, it just spigots and it's all open. But not only did it have gang showers, but uh, the toilets had no walls between them. So you could shake the person's hand. Hi, how are you doing? Here? <laughs> hand me some toilet paper. <laughs> I was constipated for the first two months. It was, it was terrible. Finally, we built some walls in between. I mean, it was one of the first jobs that I did. It was actually masonry. <laughs> Terrible, terrible stuff, Dan. I mean, it's like, I oh, used to go to the bathroom at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's like, where is the, everybody was going to the bathroom at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, it was terrible. So anyway, Scott was very uncomfortable with his body. But we knew right from the get-go that Scott was, was gay. I mean, you know, it was, it was clear as day that he was, uh, he was homosexual. Graduated from high school, and when we graduated, I went to uh, theology school. He disappeared. He disappeared into the underground gay scene in Houston and cut off all connection with the church, all connection with us as friends. I had nothing. It was six years ago that I finally got back in touch with Scott. Six years. Uh, and when I got in touch with him, uh, he, he had changed his name from Scott to Kale Sun, which means uh, warrior of Scotland or Ireland, or some Gaelic word. I'm like, what in the world? And there's a picture of him, you know, in, in, uh, in, in white, you know, a very, very... Uh, provocative uh, photograph as his page, you know, at the very beginning. <laughs> You're just like, huh. Oh. Uh, and, you know, and he, uh, I sent him a message, hey Scott, how's it going? And he said, I can't believe that you'd actually me email me. I said, why not? He said, well, you're a pastor in the Adventist church, why would you email? I said, well, you're my friend, you know, end of story. You're my friend. I don't care where you're at. I want to take you from there and move you to Jesus. But wherever you are, you're my friend. Uh, and always will be. And we had a lot of university students at Southwestern Adventist University who were gay or who were lesbian, but always kept it quiet. You always knew that there was something not, not um, uh, regular about them, you know, in the sense of us being regular. Uh, and so they, we had to work with them, they had to work with us, and they kept it quiet. And that's a terrible thing, to keep it quiet. Again, because sexual sin is sin against the body. It affects us all. And the people who struggle the most with sexual sin are those who are of a lesbian or homosexual lifestyle. And their depression levels are sky high. They have the highest rate of suicide of any population rate, including our old age folk, who by the way are the second highest um, um, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to suicide rates. And again, it's because of a lack of intimacy in relationships. Uh, you know, you start losing your hearing, you start losing your mind, and things don't go quite as well as you used to go, and you, you lose your friends. So we have to be very cognizant of that and not treat them as pariah, but actually treat them with love and kindness and respect. Yeah, I think it's very important. Not accepting it, but yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. For a friend of yours, yes, good. How important is a young man's relationship with their father? Yeah, yeah. How important is a man's relationship with his father? I think it's very important. And not, of a, not all of us have had the privilege of having a good father figure in our lives. And I'll tell you that I think that Satan's greatest victory has been to attack our men and make them terrible fathers. You know, uh, we as men are naturally selfish, more than women. Uh, if you go into any home, uh, who does the most work in a house? A man or a woman? A woman, absolutely. I mean, who cooks the most? Woman. Who cleans? 
Who does the laundry? Who takes care of the children? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who does the lawn? Woman in my house. <laughs> Who takes care of the stuff on top of the house? Woman in my house. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yes. It is so important to actually have a good male role model in your life. If you don't have a father figure, your own natural father, it is such an important thing to actually have a male figure who's not your father give you good advice. There's been some, uh, some very strange studies done in Kruger National Park in South Africa with teenage bull elephants. Have you guys seen this information? The teenage bull elephants were destroying everything and the rangers didn't know what was going on. So they decided to import a big male elephant. A couple of them brought them in, put them in with these herd of teenage bull elephants who were destroying everything. And within two days, those male elephants had trained the bull elephants as to what was right and wrong. Their fathers had been shot by poachers and they hadn't been raised by male elephants to know what was right behavior as a male elephant or was wrong behavior. And we know that when it comes to male behavior in particular, if a man does not have a strong father figure, loving but strong father figure in his life, he will actually change allegiance and give it over to a gang of males. It's one of the reasons why when you see a group of men together, it's always a good idea to go in the opposite direction. Because a group of men together don't think clearly. You know? Um, for example, I'll give you a story about, about young Blagden here and myself. Young Blagden, <laughs> <laughs> young Matty and I were, um, were driving and we, we decided to go and do some forward driving with his father and Andrew, and Andrew as well. There's four or five of us going. And they decide, you know, let's go down into, uh, into I can't even remember the name of the hills where we went. We went in the hills, we were doing things, everything was going fine. And I, we see this hill coming up against. I'm looking at this hill, I'm going, this is just crazy. You know, and they're like, come on, Terry, you can do it. Ah, oh, you can do it. And my wife's looking at me and saying, you better not do this. And I said, wow, let's do it. We can do it. And all these men are talking, yeah, yeah, we can do this. Absolutely. And I see, you know, and he gets up there and boom, boom, boom. You know, they're mad. They, they don't have wives, so they've got plenty of money. And they're just <laughs> driving up these things, breaking axles left, front, center, get up to the top. Ah, you know, and then it's my turn. And I, and I go up, boom, boom, boom. And that was it. You know, I was like, and we were trying to go backwards and forward. Every time we'd go backwards, Alec was in the back. We're going to die. We're going to die. We're going to die. <laughs> and Kirsten's like, let me out. Let me out. I'm like, please be quiet. And Kimberly's like, you should never have gone up this way. I'm like, but the boys, they were talking, you know, you know. And I'm stuck on this stupid hill, halfway up this hill. They say, oh, no worries. They're going to roll things down, hook it up. We're going to pull the car out. Winch doesn't work. Well, let's go back down, turn all the lights on. We back all the way down this hill. I mean, I have got, yeah, water coming out of places that shouldn't be coming out. Get down to the bottom of the hill. It's like, whew, thank you, Lord. And then Andrew says, come with me. So I get into his little Nissan, and we drive up this hill. I kid you not, we're doing this number as we're driving up the hill, and I'm bouncing around. I'm like, everything's fine. We get a, what do you think of that, Terry? Ah, oh. it's like, yeah, ah, oh, it's good, it's good. Oh. <laughs> and then we took the back road home, you know what I mean? This is what happens when you get a group of guys together. Because guys are, by nature, competitive. We're going to push each other all the way to the edge, which is why, until the age of 25, our insurance rates are so much higher. And then over the age of 25, they reckon you've gotten married, you've calmed down. You know, you have children, you've really calmed down. Uh, and, then, and then, you know, you're not spending, uh, you're not killing yourself. Uh, in fact, by the way, ladies, you need to be aware of this. You know how ladies are, are the best drivers? Yeah? <laughs> Until the age of 25. But from the age of 25 to the age of 45, the people who have the most accidents per capita, women. <laughs> and after 45, it's about even, Lorna. <laughs> we all can't see properly. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you know, and that's why when it comes to gangs of men, you ask men, uh, why did you rape that woman? And why did all six of you rape the woman? And they will give you all kinds of excuses. Well, she seemed willing. Really? I mean, the no didn't tell you that something might be wrong? And why did you choose to follow? Well, because he did it. 
and you start to realize that gang rape is more about dominance and power than it is about sexual satisfaction in any sense of the word. And it's also about the fact that the dominant man is lording it over the other younger men who are weaker and forcing them to do something so that they can feel like they're macho men. When I first got to Colleen Church, I was um, within a week of being at the pastor of the Colleen Church, they, I get a phone call. And um, the lady says, uh, Pastor Terry, my son is in jail. Can you go and visit him? Oh, he's 17 years of age. So what's he in jail for? Well, he and his mates were out. <clears throat> they had been sniffing some, uh, some glue. And as a result of sniffing the glue, they had uh, seen a young couple coming out of prayer meeting. And they carjacked the young couple, took him into the back of the car, shot him in the head, bang, bang, put petrol on them and burned them. Found out that they burned them alive because the, the gunshots hadn't actually killed them. So he, Brendan, hadn't done any of this. He was sitting in the front seat, but it doesn't matter. The fact was that he was with that group and he could have stopped it if he had chosen to stop it. So he was 17 years of age and he was now facing death penalty. What do you say to that young man? Hmm? His best friend Matthew came with me to, uh, to the prison and, and Matthew was talking to me all the way. What if I had been there with him? You know, that's what he kept thinking. What if I had been there with him? And that's what happens. When young men get together, there is a sense of one person who is the ultimate alpha male and everybody does what that alpha male does. In my high school, we had two alpha males. We had David McCrillis and we had Darren, um, Darren Cobes. Uh, and both of them hated each other. They were both seniors. And in, within six weeks of my getting to the high school, I had to kind of make a decision which side I was going to go and join. And you know, as men, you look at each side saying, which side is going to be the winner? Which side is going to be dominant? Which side is going to actually save me from getting a hiding? I picked David McCrillis' side. By picking David McCrillis' side, I had to wear 501 button-up jeans. I didn't know what 501 button-up jeans were. But I had to go and find out, Levi 501 button-up jeans, that's all I wore. Uh, I had to wear uh, shirts that had stripes, pink stripes, because he was from California. So pink stripes, I mean, in Tennessee, you're wearing pink stripes. Yeah, it's strange, but anyway, we wore the pink stripes because that was cool. Uh, and Darren's group, every time we got to see Darren, we'd always laugh about his group, you know, you're a bunch of pansies, you know, whatever, and give off the... When we, were, when we were competing, it was his team versus our team in football, in races, in everything. And there came a time when we actually were getting to the point of looking like we were going to attack each other. And we had, fortunately, a very good principal, uh, sorry, a very good boys dean by the name of Mike Mazarek, uh, who recognized what was happening, identified it, and cut it off at the pass. And I, I am thankful to him throughout. He just died last week, and, and um, his, his daughters and I were communicating this week, because that man made an impact on my life as to what is appropriate male behavior. Because when you're in a dorm, things happen in a dorm that no one should ever know about. <laughs> it doesn't happen so much in a girl's dorm, but in a boy's dorm, there are things that happen there that will scar me for the rest of my life that I never want to... I mean, we had guys dressed up as ninjas coming in and beating the rubbish out of a principal. You know, I mean, there's just things that happen when guys are angry. And that's what we need to recognize. When boys are angry, we've got to find ways for them to let that anger out so that they can be healthy. And oftentimes, the individuals that get hurt the most are the women that they respect, but they don't know how to treat them. They don't know how to deal with them. And when a woman gets in the face of a man and starts talking and he feels smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, the only way for him to react is to lash out. And when he lashes out, he's so, you know, he's so uh, apologetic, but it's too late. And we've got to work on that and deal with it right, right where it's at. Any other questions? I mean, I've taken almost two hours of your time. I do apologize, but I can, I can talk a lot. Any other questions? Yeah, come and see Daniel. Oh, yes, yes, come on. Yeah, open up your Bibles to Genesis. Uh, polygamy, first of all, is not the norm, uh, but it is something that man introduced. And there are, re there are reasons for it, okay? I mean, it's not, that they, it's not like they were trying to, to, um, to be horrifying. But when you look at um, Genesis chapter 4, um, and then from verse 17. Now remember, sin has entered, okay? Sin has entered. And uh, verse 17, we see Cain 
lay with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was, then, Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, or Irad, and Irad was the father of Mehujael, and Mehujael was the father of Methushael, and Methushael was the father of Lamech. Interestingly, the Bible then says, Lamech married two women. So this is the first instance of polygamy, right? One named Ada and the other Zillah. And Ada gave birth to Jebel. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. And he was the father of all who play the harp and the flute. Never before this are two wives acceptable. And we're talking well over a thousand years goes by in between this time here. Okay? So it's not like it was natural for there to be polygamy. Polygamy was a male institution that was put in place. Now what Christians have done, uh, which, was, which was poor on our part, we should have really thought about this, is that when we went into, into places where polygamy was part and parcel of the culture, uh, just like nakedness was part and part of the culture, when we changed them and talked to them about modesty, we also changed them when we were talking about polygamy. If you're married to three or four wives, you need to divorce your other wives and only be married to one wife. And that was a terrible thing that we did. Because by doing that, you then meant that those three women could never marry anybody else, had no honor within their society, could not live within their society, and quite a lot of them died, and so did their children. Whereas the better part of valor in terms of scriptural valor would have been to say, all right, you have more than one wife. That is not biblical. Your children need to learn what is biblical and teach the next generation what is culturally, what is culturally unacceptable and what is biblically acceptable. Yeah. So there's nothing in scripture that says that polygamy was okay. The original intent was one husband, one wife. And Paul makes that clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. One husband, one wife. Yeah. Yeah. Most that is true, and I accept that. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, I accept that. Yeah. I wonder about the passage in scripture in the Old Testament where God says that God is actually being very, very um, critical of David. And yes. Yes. And now this, it is an interesting passage, but you have to recognize the context of that passage. You have to remember that in the Old Testament, by the time we get to David, which is about 990 uh, BC, 998, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, the way in which communities made peace, peace was to actually marry off one of your children to another child or to that king. So in David's case, he had 300 concubines. Now those concubines actually represented a treaty with each one of the tribes or tribal leaders in the area around him. And that's the reason why when Absalom actually comes in, he's given two bits of information. He's told by one group, go and sleep with David's wives. If everybody sees you sleeping with David's wives, they will recognize that you are the new king and you're taking authority over a whole area. Okay? Uh, the other one said, no, don't do that because... And, and that was the better, the better advice. Absalom did not listen to advice, went in, made sure that it was public. So he did it on the top shelf, you know, on the, on the top of the house. People could see what he was doing with the wives. Uh, and by so doing, he was claiming dominance and claiming authority, which is an ascendant authority, an ascendant dominance, which is contrary to God's understanding of where dominance should be. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good passage to bring out, but always make sure that we understand the context. Yeah. So polygamy... While maybe, you know, interesting. <laughs> no, I just can't see how it could be interesting. But, well, no, I can't see how it could be interesting. No, I can't see how it could be interesting. <laughs> Although, <laughs> you see how easy it is to actually convince yourself. You're just looking going, oh, my wife's getting a little bit old. Uh, the younger woman might not be a bad thing. Nathan. Are we going to be married in heaven? Ooh, good question. I don't know, but I hope we have sex in heaven. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. Look, I mean, uh, scripture... I mean, that was a question that was asked of Jesus, and he knew that the answer was going to be politically uh, bad for him either way. So he answers the way that he does. You're going to be in heaven like the angels are. Well, what are the angels like? I don't know. I mean, is it sexless? I doubt it, because God gave us sex as a gift. So sexuality is actually part of our creative nature, and God said, let us create man and woman like us. And so we had to have a creative aspect of who we are, not only in terms of what we can do creatively with our brains, but also physically being able to create. There is something so amazing about being able to hold in your arms your own progeny. 
and to say this person is going to outlive me and pass on my genes. I'm going to be able to pass on my, my feelings, my love, my intellect to this individual and pass it on to them. So there's something quite incredible about that that I think, yeah, I'm, I don't know the answer really. I hope, let me say it this way. I think that whatever is going to be in heaven is going to be better than what we have here on earth. Yeah. So while we have on here on earth within God's law, when it's done right within God's law, it's fantastic. Outside of God's law, it's hell. Uh, and in heaven, I would assume that it's all going to be part of God's law and therefore all fantastic. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how culture affects us? You know, I, I, um, I was a pastor in, in New Zealand of a lot of Sudanese uh, individuals and they came to New Zealand and they were struggling with whether or not to circumcise their daughters and I looked at them and said <laughs> why would you circumcise your daughter well because culturally that was what was expected your child could not get married if she wasn't circumcised to me it's horrifying to think that a woman would be circumcised and therefore lose a lot of the pleasure that she gets from from sexual intercourse uh, and therefore uh, quite often can be damaging and will kill her so how do you deal with that? Well, I, I, and I'm looking at your questions, very similar in nature. And I think that the answer to it is uh, education one-on-one. -on -one. When people come to a Western culture, like Australia, first generation from whatever country you come in, you're confronted by the way in which the culture here does things. And that's where you're talking about. You go, my child goes to school, he's confronted with all this sexual imagery, he comes home, he asks me, but it's not culturally appropriate for me to be speaking to him at this age. We have to go and do an initiation for him to be able to talk about those kinds of things. Yeah, I think that is, that is a very long, um, there's a very long answer to it, but the short answer to it is we have to be culturally sensitive and yet still be educating what is right. Yeah? So culturally sensitive, yet still educating what is right. So when a Sudanese man comes to me and says, I want my daughter to be circumcised, I need to be culturally sensitive to understand where he's coming from and also tell him it is wrong for you to actually be circumcising your daughter. Uh, and here's why. Ethically wrong. Morally wrong. Uh, the reasons it's using are not part of the biblical understanding. So that, that, but you have to be sensitive to that. You can't just knock them on the head and go rrr, rrr. You've got to be sensitive to it and take them on a journey of discovery in terms of you know, the biblical fulfillment of sexuality is good and the body is good. So yeah, I, I think it's a good question and I don't think there's a very a quick answer for it. Yes? Yeah, read it for us. That's the, that was the passage that I was actually quoting. And you're absolutely right. But again, what does that mean? Uh, how do you know? So it, no marriage like what we have here on earth, right? So what do we have in terms of relationship? Are relationships important to God? Yes. So if relationships are important to God, then the relationship type that we'll be having in heaven will be better than what we have here on earth. What that looks like, I don't know. What that looks like, I don't know. But God still instituted. Have, have you guys read? Ellen White actually suggests that in every single one of the planets that was created by God before Adam and Eve were created here on earth, that each one of those planets actually has a tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, and that each one of those planets was tested just like our planet was, but we were the only ones that actually fell and sinned. Huh? That means that there's an Adam and Eve in many other places. So what heaven's going to look like, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, I'm only going to be in heaven for a certain period of time. And then we are moving away from heaven and actually populating the earth. And that's why uh, Paul says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard what our responsibilities are actually going to be when it comes to, to heaven. All right. Thank you. All the rest of your questions can go to Daniel. He's looking forward to answering them for you. <laughs> If not Carol, I'm sure we'll be more than happy to answer them for you <laughs> on his behalf, particularly since she's had her birthday recently. <laughs> hey, thank you for the weekend. I, um, I really love coming to North Perth. It, just the, light, the enthusiasm, the energy that you guys have. Just realize that your church needs to be cloned. In other words, start thinking about a church plant 
a good healthy church plant. Not four or five people, but 45, 50 people who actually start a plant and actually get something like this. And then you, you have a sisterhood, you know, two churches that are the same and that can continue to grow. Keep thinking that way because not what's going to happen is that your church will stop growing naturally. You'll just, you, what will happen is people will leave and you'll have other people come in and replace them. And then they'll leave and other people will come and replace them. Think about what you guys are doing. Don't hold it to yourselves. Teach it to other churches and get those other churches to be strong and powerful like you are in terms of your spiritual Christian connection. Let me pray for you. Lord, I just thank you for the North Perth Church and for the young people in particular. And I love this program of following you, following him. And as we've been talking about uh, making the gospel sticky and, uh, and what type of Jesus we want to be to people around us. And also thinking about the sexual aspects and how uh, powerful that is when done properly according to your law. Yeah, I would just pray, Lord, that this church will be a beacon of light, uh, sharing strongly love uh, and grace when people do make mistakes, and yet holding a strong ideal as to what is appropriate conduct and moral conduct in our day-to-day -day lives. I want to pray for Daniel and Carol and, and uh, Daniel and Jackie. Uh, Daniel squared, Lord, in this church as pastors. Bless them and protect them, give them wisdom, and may their leadership be uh, bountiful in terms of the growth for the kingdom of heaven, I pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Can we just um, give a hand to Terry for talking a really good talk? All right. So in three and a half years at the session, don't be talking about this particular talk. <laughs> we'll talk about the other things. <laughs>